Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome our online audience and also all those of you who watch later on YouTube. This is one of over 700 programs that the Commonwealth Club has done since the pandemic started, uh, live streaming the programs we usually did live here in San Francisco and have been doing for almost 120 years now. Uh, I'd like to welcome Michael Meyer here today. He's the author of uh, Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet. Um, a very interesting look. I know our founders that we do uh, many history programs, uh, but here we have a nice, very interesting look and a unique look at, at one of the most famous of the founders um, and certainly the most uh, intriguing in all the different things that he did in many ways. Um, but, but Michael has focused on something that he did in his will. He, he placed two bets on two cities, Boston and Philadelphia, to see if, well, we'll talk all about it. But it was an interesting <laughs> bet to place, um, you know, and, and, and there are plenty of people who say, you know, you shouldn't try to control the future and everything. But, you know, the guy couldn't stop from making an experiment um, and, and he did a great job. So, Michael, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you very much for joining us. It's an honor to be here, George. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Michael, you first you, you came up with this idea, uh, obviously, uh, and, and said, let me write something about Ben Franklin, but let me focus on this. Did you run across this idea someplace and his, you know, read his will someplace or something like that? How did you get the idea? Complete carelessness. I was, <laughs> uh, I was one of the first Peace Corps volunteers sent to China, and I stayed on in China for over a decade. I didn't know at the time that Benjamin Franklin was fascinated by China. We can thank him for the first North American description of a a, a cheese made of beans that he called tofu. Mm -hmm. um, I was invited to the State Department in DC for then President Hu Jintao's state luncheon. And I walked into the reception rooms and there was Colin Powell and Yo-Yo Ma and there was Barbara Streisand and Paul Revere Silver and Chippendale sofas. And I felt completely out of place. And I, I stepped into a adjoining room and did as one does, I sort of exhaled and put my hands on a piece of furniture to balance myself. And a voice behind me said, please don't touch that. And I flinched and said, oh, is it old? And it was a Marine guard. <laughs> and he stepped forward and said, that's the table where Benjamin Franklin signed the Treaty of Paris. And I immediately felt stupid because I thought, A, I didn't know Franklin did that. And B, I forgot what the Treaty of Paris did. Hmm. And so I spent this luncheon um, feeling really stupid, you know, that I knew all this. I could reiterate facts after facts about Chinese dynasties and stuff on Chinese history. But I didn't know much about the founding of my own country. And so later that day, I fell down the wiki hole with Franklin and started talking, you know, reading all, everything he did and reminding myself. Um, but that brought me to his last will and testament. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I thought, this is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And how has no one written a story about this before? And you know it's time to write a book when the book you want to read doesn't exist. Yeah. And that led me 11 years later, you know, here we are sitting together talking about this. <laughs> well, you, you spent, you must have spent a lot of time in the archives because you've uncovered all kinds of little tidbits that you, nobody has ever written down most likely except for in these archives and uh, i loved your one description um you took a report that was done i think around in the, in the 19th century sometime that somebody thought one of the trustees of the boston i think uh, uh situation uh thought that everybody would be reading that uh forever and you were the first one that read it 25 35 years later or, i mean even even more than that so why don't you tell about about some of your work in the archives that led to this information then we'll talk about the competition between Boston and Philadelphia and how to use some of money, some money from Ben Franklin. Sure. Um, you know, it, the ledgers, you know, this loan scheme that he set up in his will was essentially he's, he's taking a thousand pounds and putting in a pot in Philadelphia and a thousand pounds and putting in a pot in Boston. Hmm. And in his will, he says in his experience, the best citizens are apprentices because People who work with their hands, skilled tradespeople, 
interact with society at the grassroots level. You know, they see the effects of policy and taxation day to day in lives. And so Franklin essentially invents microfinance with this loan scheme, which he says, I'm putting this money in two pots for Boston and Philly. And then there's going to be small loans made to apprentices who have finished their finished their training and want to start their own businesses. And I'll stake them at a below market interest rate of 5%. And they're going to repay this money over a period of 10 years. And then hopefully they um, make all their payments and the principal will continue to grow through the miracle of compound interest. And then 100 years and even 200 years later, Boston and Philly can use parts of the money to build something to benefit the common good. So to go back to your point, you know, the, the question you asked, which is great, which where did I find all this stuff? And what just amazed me is, A, Franklin was an incredible correspondent. And so there's over 8,000 pieces of writing that exist still that you can look at between that he wrote or people wrote to him. His social circle was enormous. Um, and secondly, that the ledgers for these loans and the, the bookkeepers and the managers of this money kept meticulous records that you can see, in my case, at Boston City Archive, at the Philadelphia City Archive, at the American Philosophical Society, which was the scientific institution Franklin founded in Philadelphia in 1740s, still there today. Um, the Library of Congress. Um, and so I did. I spent over a decade sort of putting my hands in these boxes of numbers and letters and trying to piece together the story of, you know, who Franklin was when he died, why he came up with this scheme, who stepped forward to manage the money, and then who received the money. And were they successful or not in the end? And the competition was won. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't even that close. <laughs> I suppose it depends on how we look at the victory, right? Like right. what are the terms? It's funny, like at the sense you you're right, you said this that there was a, a caretaker of the money in Boston who put together this beautiful self-published book explaining here's the history of the fund. And then he said, you know, future generations are all gonna want to know about this. And he tucked that book on a shelf at Harvard College Library. And until I pulled it off that shelf 130 years later, I don't think anybody else had looked at it. You know, you open it up and there's no stamps or anything inside of it. <laughs> um, Boston and Philly took two really different paths, which reflect, I think, the, divert, you know, the different natures of these cities themselves and what was going on in the 19th century in America. We can talk about Franklin as being a founding father of American philanthropy, like what that means. But Boston, you know, in the 19th century was inventing new things such as the investment bank mm -hmm. um, and the trustee. Philadelphia, on the other hand, was this, you know, incredibly diverse port, um, you know, capital of the United States, center of publishing and finance, had a mayor that had, quote, a decided distaste for learning. He had apprentices <laughs> at the Hatter. And he was elected 16 times. And in Philly, he says, we're going for it. I want to make sure that Franklin's idea, you know, is put forth and we want to keep funding tradespeople. In Boston, the people that took over the money said, we should be looking at that centennial and bicentennial payout. Mm -hmm. And this is a real fundamental tenet of what is American philanthropy now, right? That we take part of, we, we take our money, put it in a pot. The money is expected to grow while also paying out and helping people, you know, mm -hmm. and, and fulfilling the benefactor's wishes. So it's a cool story for me because I started learning all about like, yeah, what is it about American philanthropy mm -hmm. um, that's so different than other countries? And Franklin should be credited as the forefather of it. Well, his idea was uh, that, that they were loans and that they would pay them back with interest. And so that would increase the principal. So there would always be more. So his idea was to increase the principal, but he wanted it to be doing what he wanted it to be doing in the time that it was growing, not just invested in, I think in Boston, wasn't there a, a, a insurance company that probably right. that was related to, to, to somebody in the trustees that got all the money. <laughs> That's right. You know, he said in his will, so he's just a, a little flashback for everyone to see where Franklin was in his life at this time. Mm -hmm. He adds this codicil or codicil, depending on what side of the Atlantic you're on, um, <laughs> to his will. In 1789, so this is two months after George Washington has been inaugurated. And Franklin is pretty disillusioned with the way the Republic is shaping up. He had come back from Paris in 1785. He found that the Philadelphia Academy he had co-founded, which is today's University of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. had completely diverted from his original purpose. He wanted it to be a great leveling school mm -hmm. where working class people could go, um, learn practical skills like public speaking and accounting and business skills. 
he came back and found out that it had become quite gentrified. It was teaching the new American aristocracy the horror Latin and Greek, right? Now, and how so, many, how many times probably, has that happened to the University of Pennsylvania? <laughs> <laughs> I think he. Well, he's probably unique in in, Amer in the annals of American philanthropy of founding a university and then leaving, cutting it out of its will, right? Not leaving anything behind. Yeah. Um, and so when he, you know, when he adds this codicil to his will in 1789, you know, he had gone through the bruising constitutional convention. He was so much older than the other delegates by 26 years, older than George Washington even. Um, and most of those men at that convention were lawyers or they were landed gentry. Mm -hmm. um, and Franklin was different. You know, in his will, he begins, I, Benjamin Franklin, printer. He starts with his mm -hmm. trade. And so he adds his codicil and he says, you know, look, we, we decided not to have a king in our country. But I've, in my experience in England and France, people will willingly accept a king rather than have a, a class of aristocracy ruling over them. But we don't have a king. And if we're not careful, we're going to have this aristocracy come up and be our rulers. And so he had argued unsuccessfully that public officials should not be paid. He said, mm -hmm. no, you should your, for so, forsake your salary um, so we don't have greedy people running for office for their own profit. And he diverted that money that was due to him when he served as president or governor of Pennsylvania for three years. And he said, I want to take that 2,000 pounds that I did not accept Again, easy for Franklin to say, because he was quite wealthy. He didn't accept this money. Yep. Um, but I want to stake the rising generation, as he called them, of young tradespeople. And I want them to get involved. So in 1789, you know, he's, he's quite emaciated. He's suffering from pleurisy. He's on a tincture of laudanum, you know, opium uh, sedatives and so forth. Um, and is wasting away and in a lot of pain with a kidney stone. And this is when he remembers, oh, I want to I want to try something different here so that future mm -hmm. generations of Americans will keep me at the foremost of their mind mm -hmm. and will use this money. And as you say, it was supposed to perpetually circulate. He had tradition, you know, conditions that someone in Boston and Philly would have to step forward and manage the money for free. Um, they could never let the money be idle um, and it had to keep being lent out to tradespeople. He never thought for example, that maybe a worker would default on a loan. Mm -hmm. He never thought that Boston and Philadelphia might have different purposes at heart, you know, when they were <laughs> managing his money. Um, and it's funny, you know, one of my favorite sayings of poor Richards is, blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. Right. <laughs> uh, and yet, here we are, 232 years later, you know, and, and we're talking about Franklin's last will and testament, and this idea is still ongoing, which blew my mind to find out. Well, what is interesting about this is it's one of many things that he did that is still ongoing. Uh, you right. mentioned University of Pennsylvania, something he founded. Public libraries, something he founded. There's lots of things. I mean, lightning rods, um, you know, et cetera. The, the Bifocals, catheter, bifocals. odometer, yeah. uh, the Gulf Stream map that we still use. Yeah, mention, mention, the Gulf Stream. But mention the Gulf Stream map. Now, I never, I never associated that with, with Ben Franklin. So he, and as a very young man, it was when he was traveling over that he did the measurements, right? So, so how did yeah. he do that? Was it just an avocation, just a hobby? He said, why, why don't I do this as long as I'm on the ship? Or did he have that idea ahead of time? No, that was just something he came up with was when he was on the ship. I mean, it's, it's tricky when you talk about Franklin, because even in his own admittance, he writes this in his letters and his last edition of Poor, Poor Richard's Almanac, he confesses that all these great sayings I've been spinning out to you the past 20 years and, and you know, making them go viral. Um, I borrowed a lot of those from other writers, right? That mm -hmm. I took those ideas from other people. Um, and so even in his memoir, you know, he talks about that when he was young, because he only had two years of formal schooling in Boston, he couldn't, his father, who was a candle maker, couldn't afford the textbooks to send him any further. Franklin writes that, you know, all the money I ever had was laid out in books. Mm -hmm. And his earliest ideas for philanthropy came from Daniel Defoe, who long before he wrote Robinson Crusoe was on the run from creditors outside of London and fled to Bristol and wrote a great book called Essays Upon Projects where Defoe lays out ideas like pension schemes, universal income, um, equal pay for women, uh, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. um, and these are ideas that Franklin, of course, later put into use or tried in Philadelphia or, or did himself. Um, and other ones, you know, his other idea of philanthropy came from an itinerant preacher that came to Philadelphia and Franklin realized, ooh, 
the way to get things built is to keep your own name off of them. Mm -hmm. If you don't brand your philanthropy or your projects, his mm -hmm. favorite word is projects. He uses that noun more than any other in his autobiography. I mean, if you keep your name off of it, you'll get other people to contribute and buy into the cause. And so, you know, we mentioned, you just mentioned his inventions and the things he founded. Like you could go to Philadelphia today and see the Franklin University, uh, the Franklin Fire Company. There was a Frank, there could have been a Franklin Militia and a Franklin newspaper, um, a Franklin Science Museum and on and on and on. Um, and he instead said, I wanna keep my name off of that. I think he'd be shocked today at how, you know, philanthropy has sort of become a self-branding, self-advertising exercise. Yeah. But the other thing he said, and this goes back to his will and these bets is that he realized early on too, that the best way to raise money for things is to ask for small amounts. Mm -hmm. that he'd rather have a thousand people giving the equivalent of a dollar or a pound or mm -hmm. a piece of Mexican uh, gold um, than he would one benefactor giving a ton of money. And I think that's really different than today, right? We always see the huge headlines of the hundred million dollar gift or the right. university building with someone's name on it. But I'm sure you at the Commonwealth Club know this and our viewers and listeners know this too, who support public radio and public television. People will often say like, it's nice to get those five and ten dollar donations too, because they really add up, and you have more people who have a stake in what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I thought it was a very interesting combination because uh, you, you mentioned in his book, because he said I won't put my name on it, but he wasn't against getting other people to give and give put their name on it because that would help them. And it also reminded me of, of one of the funniest experiences I had traveling. Um, it was in uh, near Halicarnassus in what is now Turkey, but it was a Greek town, and it was a Greek temple sitting there, and it was. This was 89, it was out of the way and almost nobody visited it. It was a beautiful temple and completely, mostly intact. Um, but it was out of the way, nobody was there at all. You could have come in with a truck and hauled it away if you'd wanted to. But, and there were no signs except for one that was in English, translating. And there, there was something carved in Greek onto one of the columns and they had a translation of it. And the translation was, the temple committee would like to thank Mr. So-and-so <laughs> for having donated the money for this wing of the temple. So this idea, you know, that, that's a 2,500-year-old temple. So people figured this out about, about charity a long time ago. <laughs> it was funny. That's great. And it reminds me, too, when they excavated, when they were adding on to the Pennsylvania Hospital, which Franklin helped co-found or raise money for and co-founded in Philadelphia to give free health care to, to citizens at that time. Um, when they honor, when they were doing a, a new wing and they unearthed the cornerstone, it listed Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. clerk. He didn't take any credit for it. Maybe, maybe at that time, the generation was, oh, so he's the recorder of the raising the money. Um, <laughs> but he was so proud of his fundraising. I mean, like mm -hmm. he counted among his favorite inventions, the matching grant. Mm -hmm. Which again, before I started doing this research, I never really, Benjamin Franklin came up with that. And it yeah. was a way to hoodwink the Pennsylvania Assembly to help build that Pennsylvania hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and we see in this story of his money that, you know, there's times throughout the 200 plus years of this fund that he leaves that it's a matching grant that saves it. You know, another philanthropist or another admirer steps into the picture and says, I'll match Ben Franklin. Yeah. Yeah. You, you talk about in Boston, it was Carnegie that did it. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, Andrew who, Carnegie. who, who was well known for getting his name on everything. So, <laughs> someone said that Carnegie would have, you know, he would have gladly called it Carnegieopolis if he could have put his name on the on the Pantheon instead. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and very very different. And Carnegie had to be talked out of putting his name on the philanthropy that he helped build in Boston, you know, with Franklin's money. I didn't expect to spend so much time with Andrew Carnegie, but his papers are at the Library of Congress, and you know, he his rise sort of matches Franklin's in many way. And he admired Franklin so much. They were both born British subjects. They both had fathers who were tradespeople. They both made their fortunes as young immigrants in Pennsylvania. They both mastered the technology of the day. You know, Franklin with the printing press, Carnegie Rose as a telegraph operator. It was a brilliant, he could, he could um, you know, write down messages just by ear. He didn't have to, he, he didn't have to have even a pencil, pen, pencil or paper, excuse me. And as Franklin writes, you know, the essay, The Way to Wealth, Carnegie writes the gospel of wealth and mm -hmm. says, you should be giving your money away and we should have estate taxes and so forth. Carnegie, of course, also used libraries as the, the main engine of his philanthropy. And so when Franklin's fund is, is floundering in Boston and they're having a hard time deciding what to do with it after 100 years, it's Carnegie who steps forward and says, I'll match Ben Franklin. And I'll just put a button on the Carnegie thing. When I was reading his papers at the Library of Congress, I was so, you know, his biographies are all, they're like Franklin's. It's like the shelves behind me. They're enormous. There's so much written about him. 
But one speech I never saw in books is a speech that um, Carnegie gave at a centennial celebration for the anniversary of Franklin's death in Philadelphia. And he listens to these titans of industry for three days, just talk about Franklin the inventor and Franklin the scientist and Franklin the diplomat. And Carnegie finally stands up and says, I think you've all got this wrong. You know, I think we should talk about Franklin the philanthropist. That's his enduring legacy. And he's the person that influenced me to turn to philanthropy. And he said, as a young boy, when I read Franklin's works, I put aside the Bible actually and found my theology in Franklin because mm -hmm. the best way to serve God is to do good to the living, you know, do good to man here mm -hmm. on earth. Um, and so he made it, he actually said, he closes his speech with like, I, I make a humble claim on behalf of my teacher, you know, find your theology in Franklin. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I, I live in Pittsburgh now and people um, often sully Carnegie's name. Um, yeah. But in this book, I thought, well, Carnegie at that time at least really wanted to do something great with his money and revive Franklin's idea for tradespeople. Now you talk about sullying his name. I mean, there's plenty that, that's used to sully Franklin's name as well, too. Yes. Um, and I, I think it would be useful to have a sports analogy, uh, you know, for, for all of our people. You know, if their batting average is 400, you know, you can let them strike out quite often and, and, and still make a big thing. And it's very clear in, in both cases, because you, you mentioned uh, what drove Carnegie uh, a little bit, uh, but also yep. what drove Franklin. He wasn't just driven by noble sentiments. <laughs> He didn't just follow, he just didn't follow all of those, uh, you know, poor Richard uh, maxims that he put in his almanac, that's for sure. That's true. And, you know, poor Richard had even said that the, the, one of the dangers of charity is that can, it can buy, people's, buy people a new reputation. Right. And Carnegie certainly did this. You know, after I, I mentioned his name is often people um, still curse his name in Pittsburgh because the legacy of the violence that ended the homestead strike at his steelworks outside of Pittsburgh still, yeah. you know, it carries down to these generations today and the, and the workforce who say, Carnegie, you know, gave away these millions, but he could have paid his workers a higher wage instead while right. they were alive. And so, forth. so Franklin, you know, wrote about this. Poor Richard said, this is the problem with charity is that people often try to buy their way into heaven, as it were. Um, and you're right. Franklin, during his lifetime, you know, was not a perfect man. Um, I think a lot of viewers and listeners know this or they saw the Ken Burns series. But mm -hmm. it was new to me when I was researching this at the time, because everything I had learned about Franklin really came to me through his autobiography, through his memoir. And he, he only takes events in that book up to 1757. Mm -hmm. So 33 years before he dies. Mm -hmm. And that book begins, Dear Son. Mm -hmm. So everything he's writing that follows is a letter to his firstborn son, an illegitimate son, we might add, mm -hmm. um, born out of wedlock. And, you know, so in the book, you don't learn a lot about Deborah, his fantastic wife, who definitely was the foundation of his fortune. And in my book, I spend the first, you know, one of the opening chapters all about Deborah and how she contributed to his rise to riches, not only, um, you know, contributing land and, and real estate that she had inherited from her shopkeeper parents um, in Philadelphia, but also through her hard work beside him. She was very much a co-proprietor and co-owner. And I was fascinated to see, you know, Franklin gave her power of attorney in the 1730s at a time when laws of coverture made married women legally no better than dependent children. Mm -hmm. And here, Franklin, you find the pre-printed form that Philadelphia used, where it says, I, you know, Benjamin Franklin, give my friend, and he crossed out friend and wrote wife and then wrote in Deborah's name and gave her power of attorney because she ran the shop. She ran the real estate uh, portfolio while he was gone um, mm -hmm. in London and later on in Paris. So she fascinates me. But, you know, Franklin, we always think of him as being so far ahead of his time, but he was very much of his time as well, uh, particularly when it came to slavery, because not only did he benefit from the slave trade in his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, by printing advertisements for slave auctions, for printing, you know, runaway slave ads, you know, trying to find the uh, enslaved people who had run away and giving rewards. He also printed, on the other hand, the first big abolitionist tracts in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the colonies. Um, and even as the American Revolution is going on, you know, he's still legally anyway, is, is his family held the estimate is around six people. He called them servants. They were working in, in the print shop, but he also took um, two men along with him to, to London when he was working as an agent for the colonies. And so, you know, at the end of his life, Franklin repents. And I think what's interesting 
reading Franklin, especially in his letters, is you see him as he gets older becoming more progressive and mm -hmm. being willing to admit his mistakes. And so, you know, his last public act is to present the first petition to abolish the slave trade to Congress, mm -hmm. which completely ignores it, you know, and this leads into why when Franklin dies, um, he does not get a state funeral in the United States. You know, I was surprised at that too, that when Franklin dies, he was not widely celebrated or mourned. Um, the first state funeral would not happen until nine years later when George Washington died. And when Franklin dies, you know, the country that mourns him the most is in his own, which shocked me. Yeah, I thought it was a very fascinating part of your story. And also, I mean, we've, we've had several other um, discussions from other books about this period of time in history and its issue with slavery and, and the difficulty of it because some people think slavery was built into the system um, and other people are arguing, no, you know, it really was an attempt. Um, the three-fifths rule, is that an attempt to talk the South out of slavery or is that an attempt to make it happen? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and this was very interesting about Franklin because when people said nobody raised their voices at all, but he did raise his voice. And satirically, uh, I, I loved your little yes. story about the fact that when, when the Southern senators complained about this and that, that it's too hot, of course we need people to do the thing, that he, he said, well, Algerians feel that way about their Christian slaves, you know, uh, and told the story. I, I, I thought that was very interesting, but also, as you explained, it made him extremely unpopular. No matter what else he did, yeah. he, was, he was then unpopular and, 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 and distracted. And so, you know, all the other politicians of the time could watch that and say, if, if that point of view will take down Ben Franklin, who, who, I mean, how am I going to take that position on and survive? That's right. And it wasn't just Southern Congress people that were excoriating him in public. It was mm -hmm. Northerners as well, because at the same time, you know, Franklin goes through the Constitutional Convention. He's so elderly and so frail and so ill that he's being carried to what's today's Constitution Hall or Independence Hall, excuse me. He's being carried in a sedan chair only two blocks from his home by prisoners mm -hmm. from the Walnut Street Jail in Philadelphia. And he's sitting through these, you know, these sweltering summer months going through the Constitutional Convention. He wants to raise the idea of abolishing the slave trade because there's a, Qu a Quaker faction in Philadelphia, including Anthony Benezet, who's a leading abolitionist. Um, and then the Quaker faction says, you know what, don't bring this up yet. You know, Franklin at this time was the titular president, at least, of the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery. Um, and he decides, they say, keep your powder dry. We'll bring this up after the Constitution is, is um, ratified. And so when Franklin presents his petition to the Senate, you know, northern senators and Congress people are also saying, hey, you were the guy at the Constitutional Convention preaching the Great Compromise and telling us, oh, we should all come together and it's not a perfect document, but we should for. And now you're telling us that states don't, in fact, have rights. You were the one arguing that we should you know, ratify this agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you mentioned the satiric essay that Franklin leaves behind. You know, his last public act was, in fact, to write an anonymous, under a pen name. He always had great pen names. Mm -hmm. um, it started with Silence Do Good when he was 16, when he wrote his anonymous essay that appeared in Boston, making fun of, of Puritan Moors. Um, and his last public act was writing a satiric essay mm -hmm. um, to what was then the national newspaper, the Federal Gazette, under a pen name saying, wow, this is, you know, you're right. Muslim, uh, a Muslim divan in Algeria says the same thing about why we can't release our Christian slaves. So, you know, Franklin is is falling out of favor for that reason with the other founders, but he's also fallen out of favor because of this idea that public officials should not receive a salary. Mm -hmm. People roundly laughed at him at the Constitutional Convention about this. James Madison's idea wasn't much better. James Madison said we should peg constitutional or congressional salaries to the average price of a, a bushel of wheat. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, um, there's a federalist faction that's rising in power in the United States government and the federal government. And these are men that are saying, you know, we should not cozy up to France, despite all it did for us in the Revolutionary War. And despite the fact that we would probably not have a republic if it weren't for their assistance. We are cousins of the Brits, and we should have our trade agreements and our closest ties with Great Britain, despite the war. And so when Franklin comes back from Paris after serving as minister there for seven to eight years, um, you know, he's, he can't even get Congress to recompense or pay back his Parisian grocer and wine merchant, mm -hmm. you know, and he's often, you know, um, made fun of in Philadelphia and New York at that time as saying, you know, you're really an honorary Frenchman more than you are a quote unquote American patriot. Mm -hmm. um, and so this really, you know, chafes Franklin as well. And so you can read his will, like a lot of great wills, I think, you know, wills tell stories about a life. 
But Franklin's will really is a long screed too, you could look at it, of settling scores mm -hmm. and making sure that his name and his vision is the one that's gonna remain in the public mind rather than that of Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Hamilton et al. Well, before we leave the historical context, you have the nice little thing about uh, Turnbull's uh, Declaration of Independence picture uh, painting where, where Jefferson is stepping on Adams' toes. <laughs> if you look under the table in that picture in the Capitol Rotunda, yeah, you can see it looks like, like he's just, just giving Adams a little tweak there. <laughs> yeah, because it turns out that Franklin, you know, he is the sort of axis around which the Western world seemed to spin. Mm -hmm. Because as you go into his letters, you find, I, I looked at that painting, I thought, oh, that's really funny. And people have noticed this, you know, oh, it looks like Jefferson's, you know, stepping on Adams' toe. Then you go into the letters and you find that Turnbull got his start, this painter, because Turnbull's father wrote to Benjamin Franklin and said, I have a young, uh, I have a son who's showing some talent in art. Um, would you introduce him to other painters in Paris and London? And mm -hmm. Franklin and Turnbull struck up a friendship and a correspondence. And T Turnbull said, you're my, you're my teacher, Benjamin. Um, and so he goes to paint that painting where it looks like Adams is being, having his foot squashed by, by Jefferson. Well, uh, the one little detail uh, that you also cover in the book is that Turnbull was, uh, was working for Adams. Um, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and so he, he, it's like these politicians never learn, you know. I mean, they, they think they're so charming that they can take anybody and turn them over onto their side. But, you know, Franklin had his, he can say hooks or whatever, but he already had the relationship with Franklin for years before, and it had created his whole career as a painter. So he's not going to be won over by, you know, any charming politician, no matter how. And Adams really should not have thought of himself as a charming politician anyway. <laughs> Anyways. He's great, I have to say. You know, he, he's a tough, I'd love to have a beer with John Adams. If you ever ask me, like, who's the one founder you'd want to hang out with for a couple hours? Mm. He's such an interesting guy, isn't he? And, you know, I didn't know that his career started by defending the Redcoats who were involved in the Boston Massacre. Um, but, you know, before Franklin dies, for, um, Adams writes his peevish letter to a mutual friend saying that the history of our, our revolution is one lie from beginning to end. And people are going to say that Franklin, you know, used his lightning rod and smote the earth and out from General Washington, and these two did everything. But then he pauses in this letter and he says, but you know, a hundred years from now, someone's gonna read this letter and say, oh, the envy of John Adams, he could right. not bear the truth, right? But then he ends with, but my friend, to be serious, this is the fate of all, of all nations, that a nation can love no more than one man at a time. Yeah. And I was just so astounded that 13 days later when Franklin dies, he's not that man. There's right. no state funeral. His official eulogy isn't read in America till nearly 11 months after he dies. And then it's read by his mortal enemy, a guy he hated. <laughs> and for all of Franklin's great inventions, the guy stands up and the only invention that he mentions of Franklin's is the fireplace flu. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, is where his bet, this is where that codicil is so great, his last bet, because it makes his, lame, his name and his values live on for 200 years. Yeah. All right, well, let's go back to the funds. Um, and uh, so he gives a thousand pounds, which at the time was equal to, you say, four thousand four hundred forty-four dollars, which is, which is a lot of money in in current money. Um, Million at the time, yeah, in purchasing power, right? Purchasing power. And so he gave he gave a thousand pounds to each of the cities, set up trustees to 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 run it, or told them to have trustees to run it, um, yep. including ministers and so on, which I thought was an interesting touch since he wasn't, uh, you know, at least uh, conventionally religious. Um, uh, so and and then these two groups were supposed to lend money to tradesmen to get them started in life, and yep. there were all kinds of limitations. They had to be married, all kind, of, which was also interesting because he wasn't. I mean, he he had a common law wife, but he wasn't really married, married, married. I mean, right. uh, Deborah uh, Deborah had been married before uh, to a bigamist, and so you know he had a very he had a very complicated family life, and we can maybe get back to that. But let's talk about the trust before we go down that because that's a very f uh, interesting sideline, but. So the trusts are going on, and they, you know, at first in both places, they do some of these loans. They they get some place, and some of them. There's a couple of success stories, like uh, in Philadelphia, I think it was Judge John Test or something. You want to tell that yeah, story? That's so it, there were some that that were taken out of obscurity, got their loans, paid off their loans, and became uh, valuable members of society. So why don't you tell at least one or two of those stories because that's not the whole story about all that money. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. No, it's fun to turn the ledgers because the pages crinkle as you turn them, right? Yeah. And you see the, the the bonds that the men sign and they have to have two guarantors behind them in case they default. And in the Boston ledger, you see names such as Samuel Adams, 
uh, Paul Revere are backing these loans. Um, in the beginning, it works. You know, for the first 10 to 15 years, uh, there are diligent Bostonians and Philadelphians who come forward, manage the loans. Uh, the Boston, the first guy that got one was a bricklayer named Daniel Tuttle. Um, and it, and when, you, when you look at the Boston ledger, it really does feel like a village is assembling before your eyes because mm -hmm. there's a... Uh, you know, a guy, a carpenter, a bricklayer, a shoemaker, a hairdresser, a baker, a printer. Um, they're all getting these loans and they're paying them back and it's working. And you're right, in the beginning, there are successes. There's a, a young Bostonian, a Mason named Charles Wells, who ends up becoming the fourth mayor of Boston. Mm -hmm. He's elected because Bostonians are protesting against the upper middle class gentry that are ruling their city. Mm -hmm. um, in Philadelphia, there's a guy born on the 4th of July with the wonderful name Liberty Brown. And He's a silver <laughs> uh, and he rises to become president of the Philadelphia City Council, which was an enormously important job at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the judge, for example, there's a Philadelphian who strikes out to the Indiana Territory, settles in what is named Franklin County, fittingly enough, <laughs> and he, he studies the oral, passes the oral exam, becomes a judge, and then when he's elected to Congress, he's the most vociferous opponent against the Indian Removal Act. And so in the beginning, it's working. You're absolutely right. And it was really fun to turn the pages and be like, wow, Franklin, you're doing it. But then, but then. <laughs> Franklin, you know, did not foresee the Industrial Revolution. Only three years after he dies, a man named Eli Whitney um, applies to Secretary of State Jefferson for a patent uh, for the cotton gin. Mm -hmm. And the, the demise of the apprenticeship system, which Franklin so loved and which was the basis of this, of this um, loan fund, begins to be dismantled. And, you know, in his beloved Boston, where Franklin once invented swim fins to swim in the mill pond um, mm -hmm. by the neck there in Boston, that mill pond is, is filled in mm -hmm. um, and you see the railroad coming in and up the Charles River, you have what becomes Lowell, Massachusetts and the great textile mills. Um, so Franklin doesn't foresee that coming. He also doesn't foresee that Philadelphia is going to lose its status as port because of the opening of the Erie Canal, way beyond his comprehension at the time. You know, yeah. it opens 30 to 40 years after he's, he, he dies. And so along with those, those changes in, in uh, manufacturing, there's, of course, the War of 1812. There's financial panics that happen after that. I love that there's a, a bookseller that Thomas Jefferson employs to help Jefferson restock the Library of Congress after the British burned it down. Mm -hmm. And that bookseller was a young immigrant who received a Franklin loan. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, at the same time, you know, the American finance is changing. The New York Stock Exchange opens two years after Franklin's death. Franklin hated speculation because of some losses he had early on in his life that, that damaged his reputation. Um, and he did not want his money invested. But that's exactly what happens, is that in Philadelphia and in Boston, there becomes a sort of arms race to see, excuse me, who can accrue more money. And some people make some dodgy investments. And in Boston, where they invent the mutual fund and where they invent the investment bank, um, they do a much better job of, of putting their money uh, in, a, in a, a safe investment. But by doing so, they're taking it out of the hands of the working class people that Franklin wanted to back. You mentioned that uh, one of the trustees, I, I think it was Amory, um, yeah. He was sued for how he used it, and, and the lawsuit led to the prudent man rule, which, is, uh, which has been around ever since in the law for how to judge whether a trustee you know, is doing his job or not. Exactly. Do no harm, right? As long as you're acting in a prudent interest of the money, um, you cannot be held criminally liable for it, which mm -hmm. sort of gives carte blanche to how Franklin's managers, at least in Boston, um, manage the money. And there were supposed to be public hearings annually. There was supposed to be, as you mentioned, a committee of, a, of diverse church leaders, you know, coming together with the money manager and saying, how, how look, look at the books. In Boston, that didn't happen. Um, there was a man named William Minot who took it over and he was a Harvard graduate. Franklin always chided Harvard graduates. He didn't believe, felt like he belonged to that class at all. He was very proud about being part of the leather apron class. But Minot takes over the fund. And when you look through the ledgers, all of a sudden you realize like, oh my gosh, in the 60 years that this man controls the money, there are no annual meetings. Yeah. You know, Minot, well, his, his dad was an August jurist who gave George Washington's eulogy in Boston. Like, who are we to, you know, who are we in Boston to question what this man is doing with the money? We see every year that it's growing in value. Mm -hmm. um, but Minot was not someone that would have walked by any Franklin monuments or any, you know, see, Franklin probably wasn't a big factor in his rise as a, a lawyer and money manager. And so mm -hmm. he says, 
I'm going to keep my eye on the 100 year and the 200 year payout. And I should be doing my best to protect future Bostonians' gift rather than manage it for today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't do, I mean, he didn't do a terrible job or anything like that. He, he beat the, the Philadelphians by four times the amount by when he got to the 100 year mark. This but is he, the didn't, interesting he didn't do it thing, in right? a way yeah. that helped people in the process, basically. This is the fascinating thing to me. We talk about like, well, who wins in the end? It yeah. depends on what you think Franklin would have wanted. And you think about what philanthropy should do. Again, our, our version of American philanthropy is so different than other countries that we, we start with the principle, we're supposed to have it right, rise in value. We're supposed to invest it and take care of it and perpetuate, but at the same time, you're supposed to be benefiting people directly. Um, and you could argue that, you know, the Franklin, I think I do argue, I hope effectively, that Franklin's trust funds perfectly illustrate that split. In Boston, it's let's make the money rise and accrue. In Philadelphia, let's keep it circulating. And it's fun to me in the story to look at all the different characters. We mentioned Carnegie, but there's many other people that step forward and say, wait a minute, we don't like what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. And foremost among them in Philadelphia are Franklin's great, great grandsons and granddaughters, mm -hmm. including Elizabeth Dwayne Gillespie, who was a leading Philadelphia feminist who had organized the first women's pavilion at the World's Fair, had raised, you know, um, uh, medical supplies for Union soldiers. And Elizabeth Dwayne Gillespie and her cousin, Agnes Irwin, who becomes the first dean of, of Radcliffe College, sue Philadelphia and say, look, I, I you're not doing this correctly and the money should go to us instead we'll make something out of it mm -hmm. um and in boston there are people who come forward and say you know our our idea of what a tradesperson in has probably changed and we should expand the eligible uh benefit people who could benefit from this to women which they did mm -hmm. but you know we could argue that nurses and dentists and medical residents are also studying trades as well. And so they should receive the money. And so Boston does change tack and say, well, we could start giving this to medical students as well. Mm -hmm. In Philadelphia, they start saying, okay, well, you know, maybe the American dream now, as Franklin would have defined it, isn't starting your own business. Maybe instead it's owning your own home. Mm -hmm. And so in Philadelphia, Franklin's money starts to be used to back mortgages for working class people, including police and firefighters, and to enable them to live in Philadelphia, in downtown Philadelphia, to be closer to the communities in which they serve. And one of my at, favorite parts- a reduced uh, interest rate. I mean, the re interest rate was, a, was when, much lower, yeah. Exactly. At a time when bank rates were 11 to 12 percent, you know, especially as we go up into the 1970s, but they were getting 5 percent mortgage rates. And mm -hmm. it was fun for me in the book to, to find a recipient of one of these loans. And he said, you know, this to me is the definition of the pursuit of happiness, right? That I was able to move into inner Philadelphia center city uh, neighborhood and help protect these old houses and yet still work as a librarian in mm -hmm. downtown Philadelphia because I received a Franklin loan when other banks would have turned me away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so quite a bit of good was done. Uh, yeah. Quite a few adjustments are made over time. Amazingly, when 200 years comes to the end, there's still money left. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, and even a relatively significant amount of money. Uh, I loved what happened in, in Boston um, that legally the Franklin Institute uh, that is training people to do the trades uh, loses the lawsuit but, uh, <laughs> to, to the city and to, to, to the state, but then the city and the state votes to give them the money anyway. I, this is very much an American... This is very much an American story, and I think Franklin would have liked it. Franklin yeah. loathed lawyers, and he, I, I wanted to say Franklin invented the lawyer joke, but it turns out it goes back to the 1700s in, in England <laughs> and 1600s. Um, but, you know, this is a very American story. When de Tocqueville came over from France and looked at American democracy in the late 1820s and early 1830s, mm -hmm. he said, every political question in America seems to become a legal question. Mm -hmm. You know, the Declaration of, the, of Independence is an indictment of King George. The Constitution is a contract. Um, and Franklin's, you know, this, this, his, his last bet, this loan scheme, does end up in the courts. And you do see things like in Boston, as you mentioned, at one point, it got so confusing. The mayor of Boston sued himself. Right. He was both the defendant and the plaintiff in a case. And he won, of course, but it wasn't the victory he wanted. <laughs> um, but there is, you know, a series of lawsuits and adjustments to the will to try to keep it, to try to keep it back on track and to try to make it work. Um, and in the end, you know, one of the things that happens in Boston is when they decide what to do with the money, they decide to build a trade school, then the city treasurer refuses to release it. Mm -hmm. He says, this is supposed to be a one-time gift. And right. if, you, if you give us a school with Franklin's money, 
taxpayers have to support it every year um, for operating expenses, and we can't do that. In Philadelphia, it took 40 years to spend the first batch of Franklin's money. In Boston, it took uh, an entire generation, 13 years. And when the bicentennial run, you know, comes around in, in, in 1991 and in, in, in Boston and Philly, excuse me, there's another round of arguments about what to do with the money. And what I love, though, at the end of the day, you know, as you reference, is in Boston, you can walk into the Franklin Institute of Technology, this trade school, and you hear the din um, and you see young people working with their hands and learning HVAC, you know, repair and learning welding and learning carpentry. And Franklin will be so delighted to see that his money is still circulating in that manner. And I said to the head of the school, aren't you worried about the fourth industrial revolution and the automation of work again and robotics? And he said, no, no, no. There is such a demand for our graduates. We fill, we always get them jobs because even if it's a, a place that's using robots, we're the ones who know how to fix the robots. Mm -hmm. um, and in Philadelphia, his money is still ongoing. You can go to the Philadelphia Foundation website and click on the Ben Franklin Fund, mm -hmm. um, and you can add five or 10 bucks to this fund to match Franklin's gift. And it's still helping young people who, want to, who don't wanna do four-year college degrees, but instead learn a trade or a craft some sort of artisanship. Um, and I say this as an English professor, you know, there's 17 million people enrolled in four-year degree programs in America. There's about 600,000 who are doing apprenticeship programs. It's not something that we talk about a lot in our American public life, I think, that you don't have to get an undergraduate degree, at least right away, or if at all, to have a fulfilling and happy life. Yeah, and just for all those billionaires that are listening that want to do something similar, um, just mentioned that, that uh, you, you mentioned in the book too, Carnegie um, funded the, what's now TIA, CREF or TIA now, uh, that's their name, that's Teacher right. Insurance Annuity Association. Um, he got that started in the early 1900s and they now have five million professors. He, he just thought it was terrible that, that the professors got paid so badly and then that they you know, died poor because they didn't have anything. So he set up this retirement fund. Five million professors and teachers have their fund that they have a one point three trillion dollars and just as an aside I, I did a lot of work for them I, I as a lawyer in New York I, I worked for TIA uh, I mean a, as an outside lawyer um, yeah. helped build the Mall of America was built with TIA money um, oh, skyscraper <laughs> right next to the Sears Center in Chicago was built with TIA money so they keep putting money back into things uh, over, over over time as well as this and you know it's, it's fascinating I mean if, if you just look at Franklin's life as spinning things off he, yeah, he just he just and as you, you mentioned, he, he didn't take a patent on some of on lots of his inventions. He just wanted people to to uh, use them. It was a payback from him to society. I'm amazed, you know, again, in the book, I call him the forefather of microfinance. But also, yeah, he's the forerunner of the open source movement, because as mm -hmm. you say, he there weren't necessarily patents in Pennsylvania at the time, but he could have received what was an exclusive commercial license for his inventions. And you're right. He said, just as I benefit from the inventions and technology of others, I want others to benefit from mine. Um, and so, you know, th you could, the lightning rod for crying out loud, right? He, he put in his newspaper, well, it's really easy. Here's how you do it. Even his famous experiment that proved that, uh, you know, uh, lightning is electricity. He said, anyone could do it. But until him, no one had. Um, and I love that, that you still see his inventions in play today and his ideas in play today. It does perpetuate. And to go back to your point about Carnegie and TIAA and Franklin, you know, I think philanthropists listening right now could disagree with me, and I'd love to hear from you if so. But one thing that struck me in looking at these ideas that these people had was they were playing such a long game. Mm -hmm. You know, Franklin on his deathbed saying, I want Americans 200 years from now to have to be thinking of my ideas and my legacy, and I still want to be of use. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many people today are thinking about America in the year 2,222. If they are, I'd love to hear about this. Um, well, they, want the to be frozen. they want to be frozen and then unfrozen then. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll be colonizing Mars or something else, right? <laughs> but Carnegie, you're right, the same idea. You know, he's a plutocrat. Yeah, at the same time, he realized that teachers in America were receiving, you know, lower salaries than clerks at Carnegie Steel. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to do something about this. I want you to be able to retire and not live a life in penury for, for you know, for teaching your entire career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if you just think about that, it, you, you, he's got one idea, but what's the, what are the effects of that? 
uh, even at Oxford and Cambridge, you know, a lot of people who are professors had to be from a rich family to be able to, right. to, to do this. And now we have all kinds of PhDs that come from lower class, middle class, et cetera, et cetera, who all get paid enough to live on, um, you know, and then have a retirement, et cetera, et cetera. And although he didn't talk about those other details, the effect of what he did was to shift who could be a professor, what could happen in society. It democratizes that whole idea. And there's lots of unintended consequences, but that's, that was certainly one of Franklin's intended consequences, was to, 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 to allow people from all different backgrounds to get ahead. Yeah, and you know, with the Carnegie thing, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned that about different classes being able to rise to become professors as well, because as a condition of receiving pension funds from him, he said, your school has to secularize, or you cannot require teachers to uh, profess faith or, or attend chapel. And initially, several colleges said, well, no, we're not going to do that. Um, yeah. But in the end, most of them came around. But you're right, with Franklin, the success stories, I think, of this loan scheme, when you look at the at who received them and who rose to serve in office, are those that, you know, paid the loans back in a 10 year period and then said, I want to serve, I want to serve the public some way. I think Franklin, if he came back today, he'd be shocked that more Americans work for nonprofit organizations than they do in manufacturing. Right. He might actually be happy with this. I think he'd be elated that Americans are the most charitable people on earth and that an observation he made still holds true today that those with the lowest income usually give the highest percentage of it. Those with the least give the most. Mm. Um, that still holds true today. But the, I think one thing widows, that would The widows him. might, right? That's a, yeah, exactly. That's story. right. And I yeah. think one thing that would stun him, though, is that even though half of Americans identify as working class, at least their income levels, less than 2% of Congress people have ever held a working class job. Mm -hmm. And I think he'd see that enormous disconnect between the people who are ruling and the people who are, you know, um, I have to live with the effects of these policies and taxation and so forth. And, you know, the service sector, I think he'd say, what's that? You know, mm -hmm. that over 70% mm -hmm. of Americans have their jobs in the service sector now. And I think he'd also, Franklin loved words and he was friends with Noah Webster and he would write to Noah Webster and complain, you know, that words like progress were now being um, used as a noun as opposed to a verb, uh, very curmudgeonly, you know, language is changing. Um, but I think he'd really say like, this is interesting, you know, this zero contract hour jobs and gig workers and freelance, he'd say, these sound like wonderful things. They sound so freeing. Um, and then he find out, oh, wait, those jobs usually don't have any benefits. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, you should be learning a trade because in the end, people always ask me, like, would Franklin have been a union supporter and so forth? I think Franklin often sided with management, at least even with King George initially, before he realized there was power in a union, at least politically. But Franklin's whole idea was, you know, hey, American workers, the truest path to happiness and freedom is to become your own boss. Mm -hmm. And I think if he looked, you know, my parents are in construction. My mom can read blueprints and price jobs. I can't do that. She's smart um, and much smarter than I am. But I think when I look at the the red tape that small business owners have to go through to manage mm -hmm. payroll and to do uh, insurance and everything else. I, I just, and to find people to hire and want to work, I think Franco would be shocked at, at how much harder it seems to be for a small entrepreneur these days to start a business and, and maintain it. Well, let's talk about one real big issue before we go back to some of the, the, yeah. the nice details of Franklin's life and his family. Um, and, and that is, some people say that the great degree of uh, charitable giving and the huge nonprofits is anti-democratic because mm -hmm. if, if the tax code didn't give this break, the money would go to the federal government, the federal government would spend it the way it wanted to, uh, which, right. of course, we could that's, a whole, that, right? that's a whole other <laughs> argument, but we're not going to talk about that much. But, but do you consider it, uh, having looked at it, that this is a slightly yeah. anti-democratic thing that's going on that rich people are able to control, including Franklin, that they're yeah. able to control for the next couple hundred years after they live things that other people are doing? It, that is the criticism of mega giving, right? That you're mm -hmm. taking the money out of the tax pool, of our, our federal revenue pool, and you can give it away without any democratic oversight about who's receiving your loans. Now, you're right, this is a huge conversation. And it gets yeah. back to the kind of like, whose money is it? And how did you earn this money? And what should you do with it? And so forth. But it's real when you think about what gets money in America today. When you look at the organizations that receive most donations, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
the United Way is the top benefactor or the top recipient of money. But then the next, you know, 18 of 20 on that list, if we take the United Way and the Red Cross and put that aside, you know, most of the big recipients of money are hospitals, especially university hospitals and universities themselves. Now, again, I'm an English professor. Tuition is too high. Student loan debt is a real thing. There's too much administration being added to the levels of universities in America and too many, um, you know, college sports um, coaches being hired at massive salaries. And we can go on to this about what happens in the classroom and, and, and what is best for students. But this is where Franklin would be upset and say, mm -hmm. listen, we need a democ democratization of our giving. And if we look at the things that need our attention the most, um, where should we be focusing our, our, our funding? And in the book, even, you know, this happens. There's a guy in Pennsylvania in the, 19, the 1950s and 1960s who's a civil engineer who is working for clean water in Pennsylvania. He's an acolyte of Rachel Carson. He escapes Nazi Berlin, comes over to the States um, and says, look, Franklin cared a lot about wastewater runoff. Mm -hmm. You think, really? <laughs> but he says, you know, he could also be credited as one of our early environmentalists. And what we should be doing with his money is instead spending it on improving our natural environment in Pennsylvania, especially clean water. Mm -hmm. And again, you look at the top recipients of funding in America today. Is a clean water organization among the top 100? No, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Aside from the United Way, are job training places among the top 100? No, they aren't. There's Teach for America, which is about 98, 99 on that list. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, you know, this is a larger conversation right about how do we spend our money and i'm sure our viewers have lots of ideas about this and are probably a lot more you know smarter um, than i am on these levels but at the end of the book this is an issue that comes up is how do we give our money and to whom yeah and and, and also what comes up is when uh, people are aware that the 200 year anniversary is coming up and the money is going to be dispersed everybody is eager to be the one that gets the money which is <laughs> exactly you know, i know what we should do right about, where have you been in the last 50 years right um i'm sure franklin could have predicted that one um, yes, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, because some things just don't change. Right. So let's talk. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about his family because his family was really unusual. I mean, he had a son who was the uh, oldest one, illegitimate son, but also uh, even as an illegitimate son became the royal governor of New Jersey and stuck with the British government while his father was leading the, partially leading the rebellion. Yeah. And, and then there's the grandson, Benny, who, who runs the newspaper, I think he's the one who runs the newspaper, who Adams, you know, uh, insists, you know, that, that people can't libel him, and, and, and Benny's paper is one of the first ones uh, to get sued for that. Um, by the way, we, we had another thing on uh, about that period of time, another author, who mentioned one of the very interesting things about that anti-libel law that Adams put through was that it yeah. expired on the day of the next election, or the next, uh, <laughs> the, the next inauguration, just in case he lost, he didn't want that to be in place against him, uh, which I thought was surely made it clear what he was up to. <laughs> but anyway, uh, why don't you tell a little bit of the, the stories about the family because it was pretty wild. This was this was this was this was one of your uh, not not uh, just a, a regular normal no family in any way. <laughs> no. And, you know, Franklin, you're right. He, so he has four main heirs, and it's a very fractured family when he dies. And he knows his will is going to be publicized. So to each heir, he gave a gift that came with a moral lesson attached to it, and uh -huh. he knew that the public would, would learn from it. William, his estranged son, who, as you mentioned, sided with the king during the Revolutionary War, is exiled in London at this point. Um, and, you know, William is the first, ben the first heir listed in the will. And it says, you know, because you deprive, you tried to deprive me of the estate that I worked so hard to earn, you get a big fat nothing. You get my most worthless land in the frozen tundra of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is publicized and William is fuming over in London. Although William plays a role in this book later on as he tries to help his father's papers get published and so forth. Um, William at that point feels publicly rebuked. Um, he had lost everything in the Revolutionary War. This is another list, another loss as well. You know, in the book, I say that for Franklin, like a lot of families, the Revolutionary War was also, <clears throat> excuse me, a civil war um, because he is estranged from William because of it. And then to William's son, Temple, who was also born illegitimate and himself fathered an illegitimate child. It's a family tradition. Um, <laughs> Temple is a bit of a fop and is known as uh, being a bit of a dilettante. Um, and Franklin had employed him to be a secretary um, in Paris. 
And to Temple, he leaves all of his papers and says, I want you to make something of yourself yet. I want you to get my papers edited and published. And Temple, it takes him over 20 years to get this done. <laughs> um, and so there's all sorts of pirated editions of Franklin's memoir coming out before Temple. Um, Benny, the other grandson you mentioned, who Franklin loved, with Benny, Franklin felt like, I finally did the right thing. Mm -hmm. I, you're the only one in my family to whom I taught a trade. And I taught you how to become a printer um, at Paris, starting at seven years old when you came along with me. And to you, I give my Philadelphia print shop. Mm -hmm. And you're right, Benny um, is you know, charged under libel laws. And Benny was also the first American charged under the Alien and Sedition Acts mm -hmm. because his criticism of Washington, especially as a slave owner, was so intense. Mm -hmm. He dies of yellow fever before his trial. And last but not least, Franklin leaves the bulk of his estate to his beloved daughter, Sarah, or Sally, as he called her. Mm -hmm. And I love this too, because again, this is 50 years before laws of coverture mm -hmm. are repealed in Pennsylvania. And if Sally, he leaves a, a, a piece of jewelry that Louis XVI gave him that has a ring of diamonds around it. And in his will, he says, Sally, this is for you and yours alone. Your husband cannot touch this. I want you to have an independent income. The only thing you can't do is don't sell the diamonds um, for jewelry. Don't use the diamonds to make jewelry. It's a mm -hmm. terrible habit. Mm -hmm. But instead, what does Sally do? She starts selling off the diamonds so she can finance her own trip abroad. And for the first time in her life, Sally gets to go over. She can't go to Paris because of the French Revolution, but she gets to go to London and spends two years living in England, which I love that she did that. You know, Franklin would have, he always told her like, I don't want you wasting money. You asked me for lace to be sent to you. That made me feel like you put salt on my strawberries. If you want lace, do what I do. Take your ruffles and let moss eat it. And that will be good. That, that will make the lace. <laughs> but I don't think in the end that he would have begrudged Sally for selling off those diamonds and financing her first trip abroad. No, I, I don't think so either. I, I agreed with you on that one. That was a great, great story. There's one little detail that I just loved. Somehow, some of his papers ended up with some relative that then got to somebody else. And before anyone realized what they were, one of the a local tailor was using them to make the sleeve patterns on, on, on his papers. Um, Cutting I just, out. I just the thought that was great. Yeah, and others ended up in a stable. Um, and when people would visit this house, the people would reach their hand in the pile of papers in the stable and give them to the visitors as a souvenir. Yeah. It's a <laughs> Anybody who visits, you know, it's like a way to come to a restaurant. Anybody who visits today will give out a piece of paper written by, by right. Right. Ben Franklin. Anyway, yeah. uh, that was great. We have, we have one comment, which is nice, uh, that came in from Ann Dickinson. She said, uh, fascinating information about TIA and Andrew Carnegie. Um, I have a TIA annuity for my eight years of college teaching. So she didn't, you know, she was not cool, aware of man. that background. And I think uh, anybody who reads your book uh, will see how many things he started, you know, because yeah. you, you, you include a lot of stories. We, we talked a lot about the trust because that was the focus. But, but yeah. half your information is other very interesting details about his life, what he got started, how it went on, the effects that he left behind him. So he's with us today. And I'll just tell the audience, you know, my ideal reader is someone rushing through an airport about to get on a long flight. Mm -hmm. She needs a book. She looks over and sees this great book cover. Oh, what a gorgeous cover this is. <laughs> and then says, oh, I want to read that. You know, I'm trying. This is a page turner book. The source notes are all on the back. It's not an academic text. I want you to be as excited to meet Benjamin Franklin as I was um, the day that I touched the table on which he signed the Treaty of Paris by accident and felt that same jolt of connection, you know, that he's not a dead, old, musty sort of American Yoda who just had these cute sayings that we still quote today. He's with us today and he shaped so much of our contemporary society and his ideas still matter to us today. And I think we can all um, help carry those forward, the best of Franklin into our future. Yeah, that's a great way to end, except for we'll say one other thing, and that is he wasn't always this old guy on the $100 bill. He was a young and energetic young man. Um, he got things started at a very early age. Um, yes. So anyway, thank you very much, Michael. Great, great Thanks, book, George. great interview. Thanks for joining us. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. Thanks for joining us and hope to see you again.